Hello and welcome to MGB Wrestling Podcast, episode A1. Today is going to be a special episode because we're going to talk about Nova Pro's Cupid Chokehold event, which happened on February 17th, 2018. Um, in general, we're probably going to be talking more about WWE, probably on a Saturday or a Sunday. And um, we're going to make it more for a child's audience. Uh, we found that most wrestling podcasts are aimed more for adults. So specifically, that's what we're going to do. Now, the MGB, and we'll talk a little bit about the name right now. Um, the M stands for uh, Mason, which is my son, who's going to be my co-host. Do you want to say hi, Mason? Hi. Okay, Mason is uh, 10 years old, and he came to me just five days ago with the idea of, hey, we should set up our own wrestling podcast. So today is going to be probably very amateurish. Um, this is more for our benefit, so we can try working out how to use a microphone, how to set up a microphone, um, how to edit a podcast, how to put it together, how to upload it. Um, all those things that we have literally no idea how to do five days ago, and some of those things we still don't really know how to do. Um, the G in MGB is Graham, that's me. Um, I'm 40 plus years old, so one of the things we thought would be interesting is the difference between the, the two generations. And the B stands for Bagshaw, which is our last name. So this is going to be a um, father and son podcast, and we're going to be talking about, like I said, things hopefully that are suitable for children to listen to as well. Because uh, we did find it's very difficult to find podcasts for Mason to listen to. Uh, we do have a few uh, little things where you can contact us. We're going to be on Twitter at MGB Wrestling Pod. And you can also email us at MGB Wrestling Pod at gmail.com. So, as we're recording this on uh, Sunday morning, uh, this is an event from two days ago. This was Friday. This was Nova Pro's Cupid Chokehold. It was held at the Annandale Volunteer Fire Department. Um, doors opened at 7.30. We probably got there at 7 o'clock. Uh, Mason, do you want to talk us uh, what happened before doors even opened and sort of what happened before the first match, perhaps, get us started? So, it's interesting. Once you get there early, you can see the wrestlers, how they, um, like, yeah, they, like, work out some kinks before they do the actual match. And it was kind of weird because... You could see the uh, heels and the faces working together as a team. And we also saw Gunnar Miller smile, which is definitely not... You're never going to see that. It's uh, definitely a kayfabian yeah. moment uh, broken. Uh, yeah, kind of see Gunnar there smiling, which you never see normally. It's uh, kind of a strange setup at the fire department, but the, um, the doors are actually all glass. So you can see everything that goes on ahead of time, which we don't normally get to see when we go to the, uh, the other venue in Annandale. So that was kind of a little different. Okay, so doors opened at 7.30. And uh, before the first match started at 7.45, uh, we had a little bit of unfinished business to do, take care of. Um, we actually bought some special jerseys to wear. And you can actually see this on a picture of our Twitter handle. Uh, with it being Mason's 10th birthday, uh, we were trying to find something we could wear together for matches. Um, we're big fans of the Ugly Ducklings, who we're going to talk about a little bit later. And um, we're also obviously Nova fans as well. And we actually do like hockey as well. So for Mason's 10th birthday, um, I got him an Anaheim Ducks jersey. It's got the number 18 on the back. And it also says wrestling. So he can wear that independently um, of me and it looks just fine. For mine, I actually got, uh, it says Nova Pro on mine. It says number 20. And it's also that same Ducks jersey. So when we sit together, as long as I sit on the left, it actually says Nova Pro Wrestling 2018. So we thought that would be kind of cool. Um, we got the Ducks because, obviously, the connection with the Ugly Ducklings. And we did reach out to the Ugly Ducklings on Twitter and asked if they would sign his jersey. So that was one of the first bits of business. So do you want to talk us about what actually happened there then, Mason? So we got our seats, and then we went to the Ugly Ducklings. And, um, yeah, Lan um, Rob Kiljoy, he signed it, and Coach Mikey. And then Lance Luden was under the feathers. Mm -hmm. So, we waited a little longer, and then he came, so he signed my jersey. So, we've got all three signatures of the Ugly Ducklands on the Ducks logo on the front of the jersey, so that looks kind of cool now, and um, I think we've got pictures on that, and if we don't, we're going to post those later. Um, I'm also available at Mr. Bagshaw, M-R-B-A-G-S-H-A-W. Um, I know I certainly posted it on there that we got a picture of um, you with that autograph sign. I think probably in the future, we're probably going to look to get the number signed as well. Um, but yeah, they look pretty cool together when we sit together. And that was something that was 
kind of fun. Um, always get to Nova Pro meetings early if you don't already do so. And they certainly have pre-matches. It was one of the things I found on the internet early, and I'm glad that we did that. Uh, first match, I think, started around 7.45. And um, you want to talk us through that first match, Mason? It was Fuller's House versus Gators Pig. So, to start the match off, just Fuller, obviously, he's going to talk trash, because that's what he does. And Mr. Gator came out, and he threw uh, Gator bars out, Gator gummy bars, and I actually got one. It, it, it was pretty cool. Seven inch, um, yeah, pieces of candy. Um, they were throwing several into the crowd. Um, I guess we haven't seen Coach Gator before because I wasn't ready for that, but certainly the people in the two rows ahead of us were sort of asking, hey, you got any candy today? Um, so they obviously uh, knew about that as well. Now, the thing with this being the opening match, this was also similar to the 11th Dimension match in November, which we saw because Mike Buckler opened up that one as well. And like you said, Josh Fuller's known for talking trash. And that match got started pretty quickly because I believe Josh Fuller slapped the um, Coach Gator in the face and knocked him out, um, which brought in the other guys. Um, I misheard. I thought they said Smoking Joe Frazier was coming out for the first match. I was like, my goodness, we got a boxing legend coming out. Anyway, it was Isaiah Frazier and uh, Brendan Luther. But um, I don't really remember much about this match. Um, I remember I had fun with it. Um, we didn't think about taking notes or anything, so this is all from memory. Um, um, Isaiah Frazier and Brendan Luther won it. Um, I can't add anything to this match at all, Mason. Um, is there anything you can tell us about this match? Because I feel I did a really poor job for the first match. Yeah, I, I remember... Um, Brendan Luther won the match for, um, Gator's Pit, and, um, if you are worried, Mr. Gator's okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, I remember, I think, yeah, so, uh, Isaiah, he knocked, um, Josh Fuller out, and he was injured, and, um, Brendan Luther was, um, fresh, so he tagged in Brendan Luther, he started giving punches and kicking, uh, punches and kicks mm -hmm. to Josh Fuller, and then he pinned him and won. But the weird thing was, when he was done, he, uh, Mr. Gator was helping Brendan Luther, because he looked like he injured his ankle. I, I think you're right, that did look like it was something kind of serious, um, but yeah, he certainly had to help him out of the ring, and having had a couple of ankle injuries myself in the last 18 months, um, if that was put on, that was pretty good acting, because it certainly had all those characteristics. It didn't add anything to the plot at all, so we certainly hope that Brendan Luther um, is okay. Um, as a teacher, um, we thought it'd be a good idea to give um, grades for these rather than ratings, so um, even though I couldn't remember anything, I just felt really positive about the match, and talking to people around us, people were saying, like, wow, what a good start. Um, I gave this a grade B, so do you want to tell us what you gave it, Mason? I gave it a B. It was a great match, and I just thought, yeah... I liked it, it just wasn't, I don't know how those two got together to fight. I don't know the backstory about that. No, m me neither, but I thought it was a good start to enter. And then, anyway, moving on to match two. Um, this is where we had our first Commonwealth Cup qualifier. Now, so far at this point, only one Commonwealth Cup qualifier had been known, and that would have been announced on Twitter from uh, At Nova Wrestling, and that was Eddie Kingston. So this match was um, described as a six-man scramble. Um, it featured Bo Crockett. Graham Bell, Bobby Shields, Dominic Guarini, Sage Phillips, and the sixth person who was supposed to come out was um, John Kerman, the Kermanator. However, he was attacked by Kane Justice and was unable to start, so he was actually replaced very early on by Bro Keller. Now, having just talked about Mac Buckler and Graham Bell, Graham Bell we noticed also from that match at, um, was it 11th Dimension? And he came on with a, a bazooka last time. Or what looked like a rocket launcher to me. And he didn't have that this time. So I'm not sure if that's one of his things or not. Um, but I did see on Twitter, it sounds like somebody stole his bazooka. So um, anyone with any information, I guess you need to email Graham Bell. And then he can tell you a little bit about that one. Um, do you want to talk us through this match for us, Mason, please? Yeah. So Sage Phillips won the match. I really, me personally, I thought Bro Keller was going to win. Because, yeah, he wasn't even supposed to be in the match. They usually do that. And I thought Kane Justice was going to interfere again for some reason because he, I thought he, he was mad that he wasn't in the match, so he would probably knock all of them out, but that didn't happen. And we should probably say, we're, we're not experts on this at all. Um, we've only been following, with Mason's age, I didn't want him to start on wrestling too early. 
Um, he's been watching WWE for two years now, and we've both only been watching independent wrestling for about six months. Um, our first event was at the end of September, so there's still a lot of people we don't know. So um, I certainly wasn't familiar with Kane Justice, so um, I don't know the backstory for that one um, either. And we talked in the middle of the match. Um, I actually thought that Bobby Shields was going to win this one. I know the 1% is very popular at Nova, and they always somehow managed to win matches that they probably shouldn't, and I thought that was probably going to be a theme. And also with him coming back from injury as well, um, from a previous event, I thought it was possible um, that was going to happen as well. But very glad to see Sage Phillips win. Um, I do think probably it's set up as a possible line for the future for the Commonwealth Cup. Um, I know Logan Easton LaRoe won last year, and I know there's certainly a rivalry between those two. So I'm kind of glad to see Sage Phillips in there, and I think that's going to set that up possibly for the um, uh, event in June. Um, do you want to talk about what happened after Sage Phillips, actually? Um, I think he won by pinfall. Yeah. And do you want to talk about what happened afterwards? So, Graham Bell... Oh, I know. Gra yeah, Graham Bell, he, he, he was trying to jump out to the side. Bobby Shields, he, he blocked him. And, uh, yeah, and then I think somebody pulled Bobby Shields out the ring because they were already out there. So he hit him, hit his face, and he was knocked out. Uh, so was Graham Bell, so Sage Phillips quickly rolled him up, and he pinned him for three. No, actually, no, he pinned, um, uh, Dominic Greeny, because I remember he tried to pin Graham Bell, mm -hmm. and then he, uh, they had a big war, and then Graham Bell got knocked out the ring, he quickly, uh, small packaged, uh, Sage Phillips, uh, small packaged Dominic Greeny, and he won that after the match, he gave, uh, Do Dominic Greeny gave, uh, Sage Phillips, because he wasn't injured, uh, Dominic Greeny gave Sage Phillips, like, five power bombs, and then he knocked out. It was, it was quite excessive, yeah, and he obviously wasn't too happy about it, um, and I saw actually on Twitter before the, um, before the event itself, uh, Dominic Greeny actually said, I'm gonna be at Nova tonight, and I'm gonna be maiming fools and selling merch. Um, he was certainly selling merch, I don't think I would call Sage Phillips a fool, but he was certainly trying to injure him. Uh, quite a lot. Um, I was surprised that Terminator was taken out because I know Terminator uh, and Dominic Guarini had featured in a match also um, with the No Rings. Um, so I thought that was uh, sorry, No Ropes. Yeah. So they just had to fight inside the ring. So I thought that was something that they might build on. But yeah, he got took out pretty quickly. So I'm going to make a prediction. Probably I have a feeling probably at some point in the future, not at our next meeting because I know that it's going to be the all female one. I'm pretty sure that John Kerman's going to be facing Kane Justice. I think pretty much like what happened to the previous one where. And this is our main match we're going to talk about later. Um, Eric Royal was attacked by Gunnar Miller. Uh, sure enough, that was our main event today. Um, Gunnar Miller and uh, Eric Royal. So, I think, anyway. I think something else. I think it's going to be a triple threat match. Kane Justice, uh, the Terminator versus Sage Phillips for... Uh, uh, for the, um, to get into the Commonwealth Cup. If that happens, I think Sage Phillips would be quite rightly upset having already qualified, and Sage Phillips before. always seems to get screwed over on things like this. He won the championship, and then they came back later and announced that the ref had done a slow count or a fast count. They had to give it back to Logan Easton LaRoe, so I'm hoping that doesn't happen for Sage Phillips, but anyway, we'll have to see. Um, grades. Um, I gave this one a B as well. I thought this was a solid match. I thought it had lots of different elements to it. Wasn't quite sure who was going to win. Um, it looked like one person rolled up somebody else, and then suddenly they got knocked off, and then the next person got... So it kept me excited all the way to the end. So what about you, Mason? I gave it a B plus. I liked the match. I loved the continue... Um, they continually uh, did move after move. Like, one time, they just did suicide dive after suicide dive, and it ended with the Bobby Shields, like I talked about before. And it was a great match. I liked that um, that roll up and the little extra time because I did not want that match to end. <laughs> and I agree. I thought that was a good match as well. All right, let's move on to match three. Um, this was another Commonwealth Cup qualifier, but this one was for the ladies. Uh, this was Lainey Luck, Isla Dawn, and Jordan Grace. Now, this was actually, I believe, supposed to be two separate matches. I believe it was supposed to be Angelus Lane versus Isla Dawn and Lainey Luck versus Jordan Grace. Um, and also, as was posted on Twitter, um, Angelus Lane posted that her transmission on her car was broken, so she wasn't able to attend. So they set it up as a triple threat match. Now, I'm a big fan of Jordan Grace. I've seen her on a few different things now. Um, I know one of my podcasts I listen to, the uh, the Blade Job Show, they recommended that I look at Women's, Resolu uh, sorry, Women's Wrestling Revolution, the WWR. 
Um, and I saw Jordan Grace win the Revolutionary Rumble there just in January. And the fact that she beat 15 people, I think it was, and just looked dominant the whole time doing it, I didn't doubt for one second that she was going to beat. No disrespect to Lainey Luck and Isla Dawn. But Jordan Grace is a big star in Nova Pro. She's just so strong. Uh, the one, yeah, just like uh, Graham Bell, I don't know if her water bottle got stolen because she always comes out with that barbell water bottle. And, yeah, you can tell she's a bodybuilder. And you can definitely tell on the ring, too, because she suplexed I Isla Dawn and Lainey Look at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as you uh, before, you said if she suplexed them both it's just gonna be crazy and, and that was more of a joke i was like can you imagine if she did it and then a few seconds later she did she suplexed both of them um i like i just say i like the match but I, I just knew what the end was going to be it was just too predictable there's no way that you're not going to put one of your star performers not in the commonwealth cup for a later date and that really detracted from the storyline for me a little bit um, and also Jordan was so dominant, really. It was the second quickest match at 6 minutes and 43 seconds. Um, I was impressed with Isla Dawn. I think that was her debut. Um, she had a nice armbar in the middle and actually looked like the other person was going to tap out. And I did think I'd got it wrong at one point because there was. It looked like a slow count from the referee, but I know the people around us thought that was a three count. And the ref's like, no, not two. So there was a few little twists in there. Um, I gave it a B-, minus, um, just because I, I always want to see more Jordan Grace when she's wrestling. To me, it was a little predictable, but overall, I thought it was still a good match. Yeah, I gave it a B-, minus because, it, yeah, that slow count, that one, two, no, it was a two. Mm -hmm. The ref, it, they were obviously going for Jordan Grace, mm -hmm. so it was just way too predictable, and that was early on in the match, and you could definitely tell it was Jordan. All right, let's move on to match four. This was another Commonwealth Cup qualifier. This one was for the guys. This was supposed to be Ricky Shane Page versus Alexander James. And Ricky Shane Page got replaced by Jackson Stone. And similar to the other one, um, Ricky Shane Page had car issues as well. I'm not sure if he was actually riding with the same person. But I thought this one also had the same problems I had with the other match. As soon as you know that Ricky Shane Page is not going to be there and they bring in a replacement... Clearly, the replacement's not going to win, and you knew that Alexander James was going to win. Um, but anyway, um, do you want to talk us through that match? I know you had a few observations for that match that you noticed, from, particularly from people around us as well. Yeah, I also liked his knee pad. It said, Lights, Camera, Jackson. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I thought it was a great match. I, I thought the crowd really supported them. Often when you get those um, the newcomers, the first-time people there, um, it's difficult for them to establish a character. Uh, people don't know who they are, but I, I thought the crowd were really supportive of him. Um, I thought they were really feeling his character, which I, I really liked. Yeah, Alexander James is a one percenter, and I I really liked the sign. It said um, a ninety nine percent, and uh, yeah, so Jackson Stone knocked Alexander James outside the ring, and uh, this fan he said he yelled at uh, the fans not to touch him or talk to him. And he said, he yelled to Alexander James, I'm here if you need me, I'm here if you need me. I thought that was really fun. Yeah, we were we certainly weren't in the corner where the one percenters of the gated community sit, but we certainly had some uh, one percenters fans around us, that was for sure. Um, I don't really remember the finishing for this one either. Um, I don't remember any specifics. Um, like I said, I, I thought it was a good match, and the only criticism I gave it was I gave it a B- minus again, just because I thought it was too obvious he was going to win. I never really believed Jackson Stone was going to win. He had his moments. They gave him a chance to show his character. Um, certainly one who I'd like to see come back to Nova Pro so he can actually show us a little more of what he has on another date. Yeah, Alexander James, he got like three arm bars on Jackson Stone and he got out of all three of them. I thought he's really talented. And he, he got, I don't know, about 60% of the match, Jackson Stone. And yeah, I give it a B. It okay. was a nice match. All right, let's move on to uh, match five. This was uh, between Faye Jackson and uh, Lou Fister. And actually, Faye tweeted before that it was the second anniversary of her first ever wrestling match. Now, that really surprised me. And we've only been going for a few months, but it seemed pretty obvious when we were there that Faye was a big star. And I guess she'd been wrestling for 18 months at that point. Uh, but she'd always seemed way more seasoned to me. Um, she's obviously somebody who's picked up the wrestling vibe very quickly. And um, yeah, that, that really surprised me. Now, I actually thought, for me, this was the first time that I'd seen Lufisto. And what I'd actually forgotten was, until I looked back, she was also at 11th Dimension. 
Um, it was a it was the tag team event right at the end, which was five women against five women. Um, and surprisingly, Lou Fisto and Faye Jackson were actually on the same team, which made me think, well, why are they fighting today? But I think you remember why this happened, right, Mason? Yeah, because uh, Faye Jackson, she tried to punch, I don't know, I think it was Alley Cat on the other team, okay. and she accidentally hit, uh, punched Fisto. And so it was a, the ref called it a tag. Mm-hmm. And she came in and started beating down Faye Jackson. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, she, and then, uh, Alley Cat, she would, uh, yeah, she pinned Lufisto and she was mad at Faye Jackson. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. And so that's why they're together in a match. And I think she came back out after mm-hmm. she'd been knocked out and yeah. had a, some more beef with her. So that caused a little bit yeah, of tension there, which I guess is probably what set it off. And Alley Cat did go on to win that one. Now, I feel kind of embarrassed about this one. I was getting a little hungry at this match. Um, and I knew that the I knew that we were coming up to probably the Ugly Ducklands, because so, they normally come up just before the intermission. Um, so I went to get a hot dog, and um, we were watching while we were waiting for that to be served. And um, during that time, she actually, Lufisto actually pinned Faye Jackson. Yeah. So we didn't get to probably watch that match as much as we should have done. And actually, it finished as the shortest match of all. It was 5 minutes 47. Um, probably one thing that we did miss is, right at the start of the match, um, Faye Jackson was announced and she came out. And I don't think Lufisto was even announced before what happened um, to start that match off. Can you tell us what happened before the match started properly even? Faye Jackson and Lufisto are part of the One Percenters, and, um, yeah, uh, Faye Jackson was dancing around, uh, the One Percenters, and, uh, Lufisto, she attacked Faye Jackson, and then they had a little war, and then, uh, Lufisto came to have a break with the One Percenters. They held Lufisto down, so Faye Jackson could, yeah, like, give her some punches and kicks. And I think you saw more of this than me. I think my stomach was taking control of this part. So, um, yeah, I would say they certainly battled around the outside of the ring at the beginning before the match started officially. But, yeah, um, I gave this match a C. Uh, probably nothing to do with the, the ladies at all. Um, like I said, I was more hungry and the match was kind of short. Um, I'm not sure that Faye Jackson normally has matches quite as short as that. So I know they could have definitely... Um, when you've got stars as big as Faye Jackson, and certainly Luke Bisto as well, who I've also seen on WWR, um, I would have thought they would have probably given them a little bit longer. Um, I guess at the same time, I kind of like it that it changes things up a bit, what you expect, and then they give you something that you don't expect. So, um, Yeah, so like I say, I gave it a C. I don't know about you, Mason. I gave it a C+. Plus. I didn't okay. like that uh, Faye Jackson had to tap out, though. And, um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I usually Faye Jackson, she comes out and the ref checks her, but she didn't get to checks this time. Checks her butt or yeah. checks her butt? <laughs> she checks her butt. Okay. And uh, they're usually dancing around. Uh-huh. She checks her and then uh, she We've turns around. We've had the around. dolls flying before too. And then uh, the ref's like uh, mm-hmm. patting around. And, yep. And then she and then she wants her to do it. But so they did mix. They did certainly mix things up a little bit on that one. All right, let's move to our last match before the intermission, and this is obviously one that we I talked about on Twitter before. The two matches I was looking for was one to the most. One of them was the Ugly Ducklings, and the other one was the Tim Dunst match, which we'll talk about later. So this was before the intermission. So the Ugly Ducklings, Rob Kiljoy and Lance Lude, and versus the Hooligans, who are Devon and Mason Cutter. And they are supposedly, we've got our Mason here, so he was slightly torn on this one. Um, Build has been from Brutalsville, USA, which is clearly a made-up place. Now, I'd actually seen the um, the Hooligans versus the Ugly Ducklings um, on YouTube. Um, it came up, I think it was on uh, Rob's uh, Twitter feed. Um, it was the FIP Tag Team Championship. And the Hooligans are actually the longest reigning tag team champions. So, um, if I remember correctly from that match, it was actually interfered by, by a third team. But that's certainly a good one to look up on YouTube if you get the chance. Um, the thing that I noticed with that one, it was much, pretty much like a hardcore match. Um, the hooligans had their cart with all the things in the chairs, the weapons, and stuff like that. And that's pretty much what happened for this one. Now, we knew that Lance Lude was probably not feeling 100% for this one, so we probably realized it was going to be kind of a short match. Um, they get, those guys came out, the hooligans came out with their carts, with all their stuff in. And um, you want to talk a little bit about this match then? I'm so surprised. Uh, Lance Lude got, the, got a good beating out of him. And he was already under the feathers, as Lance, I mean, <laughs> yep. Rob Kildrew said. And, um, yeah, so he was, uh, Lance, he was in the wheelbarrow, and, um, yeah, the, um, hooligans pushed Lance to the one percenters, and the wheelbarrow tipped over mm-hmm. on top of Lance. And the, I'm so surprised about this move. 
So, uh, Rob was in the middle of the ring. Uh, Mason, he got lifted up, did a, up by Devin and did a flip on top of Lance Luton. They're huge guys, and they did that move. It was, yeah, Devin had to put his hand there for Mason. Might style. have jumped a little bit as well, but they certainly looked like a, a, display, a display of strength, that was for sure. Um, I think both teams got a chance to show their signature moves as well. Yeah. Um, we got to see um, Rob flip uh, Lance into the other two guys. I'm, I'm forgetting the name. I think you remember what the name was uh, earlier. Launch McQuack. Launch McQuack. There you go. And we actually had two of those. We had one from the outside of the ring, and we also had one from the inside yeah, of the ring. Yeah, I like it. There's also the three moves together, which I can never remember what it's called. It's something yes. like Duck, Duck, Goose, or something like that. And then we got to see that one as well. We didn't get to see the McQuack stay device or the doomsday it's like doomsday device. duck's day device yes. there we go and we didn't get to see that one but with lance not feeling too good that was probably understandable uh, coach mikey put in a good role as well he managed to distract the other team and there was a little chase around the yeah. ring and of course by that time it gave chance for rob to recover a little bit mm -hmm. and uh yeah the ugly ducklings won that match and went on to selling their merch as they always do to take it straight into the intermission um, and uh, yeah, I gave this match a B. It had everything I was looking for. It had the classic Ugly Ducklings moves. It had the silliness. It had the craziness. Um, I thought the hooligans played a great role. Obviously, they're used to facing each other as well. And I thought that I thought it showed that they were obviously comfortable with each other. And I thought they did a good job of um, helping the ducklings on this one a little bit with all the other circumstances. Um, I gave it a B. My obvious for me, it's. Um, I got in the quack quack ring at the start before the match, mm -hmm. so I thought that was my favorite part because I that was my first time. And luckily, the dad in, in front of me uh, went to go get a hot dog so I could squeeze through <laughs> his chair and actually get in. Yeah, Lance and um, and Rob put their arms out together and he sort of put hands on top of each other and then he lift them up and down like a duck flapping its wings and go quack quack. And we've seen it a few times. We've not quite been like the Mighty Ducks. We've not been able to do it yet, so I'm glad that you got the chance to do that. I gave, um, it, I gave it a B plus. Okay. I thought it was a great match. Physical, hardcore. Yeah, I liked it a lot. You got to see all the good finishing moves. And that led us into the intermission, and um, I think we're going to take a little break as well. Go and get a cup of tea, perhaps, and a scone. Uh, we've been doing 25 minutes right now, so that's probably the longest we've talked ever so far on this, so... We're going to take a little break, and then we'll come back with the second half in a few moments. And we are back. So, after the intermission, we started off with um, the Community Cup champion, uh, Logan Easton Leroux. And he was facing Wheeler Yuda. I believe this was his second match in um, Nova Pro. We saw him, I think it was a couple of months ago. I think he might have even been facing Sanjay Dutt, but I didn't actually write that down ahead of time. Um, and these were really the two guys we saw most through the, um, the windows as we were waiting for the uh, doors to be open. Those two were on the nearest side to us. So we actually got to see some a little preview of what this match was going to um, uh, to look like. So do you want to talk us through this match a little bit, Mason? And before the match started, Logan LaRue, he's a 1%er and a heel. So he was doing his 1% stuff and he yelled out, Ladies, I got a, I got a present for you. And then he held up the 1 for 1%. <laughs> And then uh, the 99 percenters didn't like that. And uh, they, uh, one of the fans shouted out that uh, his sweater looked ugly. And he said, <laughs> Logan LaRue said, his sweater looked ugly. And then they started a chant for, uh, lo at Logan LaRue, dress for less. Uh, and I that got picked up pretty well by the crowd. Um, I think with always, whenever there was one percenters there, part of that gated community, there's obviously one side of the room that's very supporting of them, and normally one, one side that's not. And we had the traditional, I think it probably in other matches as well, um, the gated community shouting, 1%, and then everybody else shouting, sucks. So there was quite a few crowd moments for this one. Like I said, the dress for less one was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I really do like that organic nature of Nova Pro where some of the chants just come out from nowhere. You never quite know what they're going to be, um, but I think they build on them pretty well. Um, I don't have much for this match either, actually. Um, I think I was kind of absorbed into it. Um, you never want Logan to win. Well, I never want Logan to win. Um, I'm a big fan of Wheeler Utah. Um, I thought that first match of his was really good. Um, I saw one more of his matches on Powerbomb TV. Um, the thing that stands out for him, for me, is when he comes out, he really reminds me of DJ Z, yeah. who um, we also saw from, from Impact. Um, but also when he fought Sanjay Dutt, he has that mask on that sort of lights up. Um, he has a very similar style, but he's certainly more technical um, than Logan is, I think. 
Um, so I was rooting for Wheeler, but that certainly didn't happen. And Logan actually did end up winning this because that's normally what happens with Logan Easton Laro. He finds some way of winning. Um, I don't remember if he cheated a win or I, I'm really struggling on this one. I feel kind of embarrassed. I didn't take more, pay more attention to this match. So what happened was, um, yeah, Wheeler Yuta. He did, it was a clean match. Mm-hmm. Nothing really happened. It was just like punches and kicks. Um, yeah, there wasn't anything out of the ordinary in that match except I. I <laughs> there's another funny thing that happened. Uh, Wheeler Yuta. He he lost, and then a fan shouted, "I'll give you fifty cents if you can play a game, and you can play again." I thought that was really funny. <laughs> All right, so as we didn't really think too much about this match, I, I gave well, we don't have much to comment on it. I, I gave it a B. I, it had me gripped, but I just it was just some. I just don't really remember anything specific about it. So I just had a positive feeling about it. But let's give me your grade, and then we're going to move on to our match that we probably care a little bit more about. I gave it a B. There wasn't yeah, it was just a clean, ordinary match. All right, let's move on then. Match eight. This was the second one that I said I was really looking forward to. Uh, this was Tim Donst, who goes under the moniker of Safety First when he's at Nova Pro versus uh, Jake Connell. Now, like I say, Tim Donst is, I think, probably, well, certainly my favorite singles um, wrestler um, on the indie scene right now, because we've seen him several times. Um, and I was also excited to see Jake Parnell as well. Um, for those of you that don't know Jake Parnell, um, he was in featured with a match on uh, Zero One USA Wrestling on January 27th against Gary J. And this last man standing match started pretty normally, and then after 15 minutes, the ring posts were coming down, the ropes were coming down, the, the floorboards were coming up, the protective matting was coming down, um, and he got part of the um, turnbuckle in his mouth and then was thrown out of the ring, and unfortunately actually stuck in his mouth and ripped part of his jaw out. Uh, the pictures on Twitter are certainly uh, kind of gruesome, um, and amazingly, he actually carried on that match, and he actually dropped his title to um, Gary J in that match. Um, and I know he was out certainly for at least three weeks, and um, he came back, I believe it was the day before, before this match, so he'd had one match, but this was his second match back. So I know Tim Donst has a, an aggressive reputation, um, except for when he plays his safety first. So I was really interested in that whole contrast of Tim Donst, safety first, Jake Parnell, last man standing, mouth ripped out pretty much, uh, to see how they would go together. Um, I also said on Twitter I was really excited to try and predict, what's Tim Donst going to do this time? Every time he has something a little different, he's playing with the rings like out his wrench, and he's tightening up the ropes, he's measuring the ring, and then he uses the tape measure to wrap it around somebody's neck. I was kind of interested to see what he was going to do with this one. Um, do you want to throw something in? Because I feel like I've already talked too much about Tim Donst already, because I got, I got really excited by this match. Yeah, so he brought uh, Tim Donst, he brought out the risk committee, and it was duct tape Doug and Cool Kyle. Cool, cool caution, caution Kyle. Kyle. And, um, yeah, we didn't know the names of these until afterwards. Um, I'm One of my big gripes about this, and I've got to make sure I ask this on Twitter for the next one, is um, where's the Wi-Fi password for that place? I could not log on at all. My data was low. Um, I missed Tim Donster's tweet about the risk committee. Um, but, yeah, um, Cool Caution Kyle was the guy wearing the crash helmet for the motorcycle helmet for people that weren't there. And duct tape Doug just basically had duct tape wrapped around his head. Um, and other things, but I thought they were kind of cool. They added a new dimension to his matches. Um, lots of the, the crowd are always going to shout, that's not safe, when everything Tim does does something that's not safe. Or when he does something, he's going to say, safety first. So while he's making his moves once the match started, climbing up to the top rope, clearly not safe, unless you got somebody holding your hand from both sides, and then he could perform his high-risk maneuvers. So I thought that added something. I thought that really added to that, um, to that match. I really liked that element of it. I really liked it uh, because one of the good thing was he was safety first for a while, and then he get less safe and less, less, less. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, because uh, there was a kid shouted out uh, to Jake Parnell, who's a war horse, that said, no horsing around. And, and there yeah. was a few of those as well. Somebody called him and they said, you look more like My Little Pony. Um, there was a lot of jokes that I was going to mention that he looked like he was in a stable condition. But there, there was definitely some interactions within there. Um, he also got up and said he was ready to throw the uh, safety book away. Um, I thought Jake Parnell did a really good job in this match. Obviously, he was second fiddle to Tim Donst, but I thought he played an important part in that story. Um, and perhaps, actually, I mentioned for the other matches, I forgot this one. Jake Parnell was actually a stand-in for this match. It was supposed to be Tim Donst versus... I'm not sure if he's still the Powerbomb champion, um, Jonathan Gresham. So that's pretty big boots to fill. And um, I thought Jake Parnell on his debut did really well. 
Um, I certainly hope he gets invited back to Nova Pro because I would like to see a more aggressive style match. Perhaps with somebody like um, perhaps the Terminator or somebody who has that more aggressive style. I thought that would be interesting to see. Um, we had a great seat. Uh, we were pretty much positioned where the camera was so you could see everything. And I took some great footage. There was lots of streamers thrown in when Tim Dobbs came in. Um, he was playing to the crowd. He actually broke through the, the through the duct tape. It was like a starting, like he chopped through it or he did a kick through it. And then he raised it. And he raised it. And um, it, silliness as always. Um, is it the most technical match? Probably not. Is it entertaining? Absolutely. Um, for me, I post on Twitter afterwards. I thought this was a match of the night. And I gave this a great A. And, and Tim Dons can do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Also, he grabbed somebody's sign that says safety first. And then he put it in his mouth. I felt like yelling, that's not safe. <laughs> <laughs> because he can get a pick to cut in his mouth. And, um, yeah, I thought it was great. I gave it an A. And that and character's definitely building. Um, on the Halloween one, um, it was dressed as your favorite wrestler. Um, Mason actually dressed up as Tim Dons. He got the hat, he got the the, um, the glowing uh, vest, so you could see. And uh, Tim Dons actually came and talked to him afterwards, which I thought was a really cool gesture. And I noticed um, on this match there was even more people dressed up. Because you had a few high fives from people who were also dressed up as Tim Dons, probably about three guys. And then the people in front of us started handing out the, the colorful vests. So there must have been 10 to 12 people, at least, who had these vests on for his match. And before the match even started, he pulled over the cameraman. And then he sort of laid back so they could get... It wasn't a selfie, but he got a picture with all his fans there in the uh -huh. vest. So Tim, I think, works the crowd really well. I'm really excited to see how that um, character continues to evolve. I think that's an exciting one. All right, let's move on to let's move on to match nine. So this is our next to last match. Um, this is um, the new teaming of I believe uh, Pow Meow and the Carnies. So Pow Meow is Alley Cat, and she was with um, Nova Pro debut Christy James. And the Carnies we've certainly seen before because I know that they faced uh, the Ugly Duckling, so we were familiar with those. And um, there's the dog faced gargoyle that is Kerry Awful, and there's also the ringleader in the very stripy pants, uh, which is uh, Nick Iggy. Now, this was also Alley Cat's birthday, which I think is something that certainly at the start, we, we've got a happy birthday song. Um, people were playing on that a little bit. Um, now, this actually turned out to be the longest match, so we probably should have a lot to say about this one. But um, Do you want to start us off with this one? What do you thought about this match? Yeah, so at the start of the match, uh, Christine James, she gave her glasses to the kid in front of me. It was pretty cool, and... Uh, they started singing Happy Birthday to Alley Cat, and, um, yeah. And, obviously, you know, the Carnies, they would obviously get a microphone or something and start yelling, so, and, yeah. There was a lot of trash talking. Um, we don't normally see these intergender matches, certainly not on WWE, because they don't do that anymore. Or if they have mixed teams and one, one person tags in, the same gender has to tag in. So, no, we did have it the whole time. It was always male versus female the whole time. And um, obviously the guys were overconfident because the carnies already are. They were talking a lot of trash. Um, but I thought they set it up really well. I, I was buying into it the whole time. I thought it was entertaining. Um, I thought it was silly. Um, I thought Christy James was very athletic as well. I didn't really know anything about her. She had some good moves where she jumped up on the ropes and then pulled the people down. Um, I, I thought they were, I, th I really enjoyed this match. It was Christine James' debut, so mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought it was a great match. I gave it an A minus. It was really good. And I'm almost there with you as well. Um, I gave it a B plus. Um, I, I guess we should have talked that um, Pow Meow did actually win that match. And in, ca in case I didn't make it clear, Tim Donst also beat Jake Ponell as well, which that was obviously going to happen as well with Jake Ponell coming in at the last minute and J uh, Tim Donst being the star for that story. Um, I mentioned it was Alley Cat's birthday. Um, also, it's, it, I still find it impressive that um, Alley Cat's only been wrestling for less than a year. Yeah. She was at the uh, tryout program um, last year, and she obviously came through that program. And um, she's certainly been, I think, at every wrestling match that we've been to at Nova Pro. So she's becoming fairly established for us. Um, I also saw literally this morning, just before um, we came on air to record, um, the um, the gated what the gated community, which can be found on Twitter at one gated community. Um, they got some merchandise which they didn't have for sale on this one. Um, but they have their playing cards, which are famous. Um, I think Alley Cat's listed as the Nine of Hearts. That was their new one. Um, and they also have another, some new stuff as well. Uh, it said that U.S. Uh, post office let them down, so they didn't get their merchandise through on time. So um, that should be sale on sale at the next one. So certainly make sure you check that out. Which actually perfectly links into our last match, because um, we've been trying for Mason ever since we've been going to these to try and get at least one picture 
uh, well, pictures with people who we talked to. Uh, sorry, photos with people who we talked to. But we're trying to get a picture as well. Uh, trying to get them to sign it, and then we're trying to collect them together and build up sort of a little collection. So, do you want to tell us who you got for for this one? I got Gunnar Miller. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, he he's probably my favorite one person. He's probably him, Alley Cat, Faye Jackson, and uh, Lufisto are probably the only one person I like. I don't know if Lufisto isn't one percenter. Yes, I know you said is. that. Okay, she I guess. Is. All right, that's part of it. I missed that. Okay, I guess I didn't notice that one. So I guess if they were on the same team before, that would make sense. But I guess I missed that. So, uh, yeah, like you said earlier, we saw Gunnar Miller out of character and smiling. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we got one of we got his autograph. We saw they had the playing cards. We didn't have one of those playing cards. Um, so we got that one. I'm trying to – I should have written it down. Is he the King of Hearts? Uh, yeah. I think he's the yeah. King of Hearts. So we got that picture, and uh, Gunnar was good enough to make the little C for us for the uh, – because he's the – what is he? The corporate, corporate captain. captain. Um, so yeah, so that links those two things together, and also similarly to the last one as well, um, it was actually Gunnar Miller's birthday as well, which I didn't realize until um, actually we left and we came back. So this was the last match, this was the main event, so it was Gunnar Miller versus Eric Royal, and I'm sure it stems from what we talked about earlier, Eric Royal at the end of the um, tag team match before, when he was with David Stone, got attacked by Gunnar Miller, and I think it was announced pretty much, it might have even been in the same event, that next time you're going to see Gunnar Miller versus um, Eric Royal. Um, also, I think the thing that added to this element as well, with Gunnar Miller being in the 1%, um, we did see on our first event we went to, the uh, Project 3, Eric Royal actually defeated one of the 1%ers, Logan Easton Leroux. So um, this was a chance to perhaps get a little bit of payback. Um, Eric Royal's clearly the bigger man, physically, but Gunnar Miller, you look at those muscles, he's just a really strong guy. Um, I know people were chanting to him, Bobby Roode, because he definitely looked, for people who don't know who he is, he definitely has that same sort of... Uh, Look, same face, but I think he's much stronger than that. Yes. I, I mentioned before the match, to me, he reminds me of almost like a Brock Lesnar type of character. He just looks so strong. He just looks like he can knock anybody down. Um, they certainly had ones where they were challenging each other for shows of strength. They were bashing into each other, trying to knock each other over. And I think, actually, I think Gunnar Miller got the better of those. Yeah, he, he won the match. And I gave it a B. It yeah, because he, you can see he's going to win every match because he's turning into like a Brock Lesnar. And I would agree. I, I gave it a B plus. I, I thought it was really good. I liked that the Eric Royal, as strong as he is, Gunnar Miller was still able to like pick him up and suplex him and put on those power moves to him. But yeah, I think Gunnar Miller is definitely one of those characters that it looks like that's how they're developing him as somebody who can you actually beat him. And right now, when you see him in the last few matches, um, I don't think that. He just looks such a dominant character. And I would totally agree with you. Um, as a general, I don't like the one percenters, and I would boo with them. Um, I actually like Gunnar Miller. Yeah. I think he's a really good character to watch. Um, and, yeah, and that concluded. the. Uh, that was match 10. Um, I think it finished around 11.20 at night. So we actually got, as always, good entertainment value, four hours worth, because... Um, we got in just around 7.30, so until 11.20, it was almost four hours, so that was pretty good. Um, I, that conclude, I guess that concludes what we're going to talk about today. Um, I know during the course of this, we've talked about some of the matches that we've watched. Um, if you get a chance, if you really are into indie wrestling, there is a lot of Nova events at uh, powerbomb.tv. Uh, it's $10 a month or $100 for the year. Um, if you sign up, I think they give you a 10-day free trial. Um, I know when I signed up, I used the code NOVAPRO, and that gave me a 20-day free trial. And I was so impressed, I did actually sign up for the whole year. So that might be something uh, you want to look into as well. Uh, one person I definitely want to thank who helped me with a few little pieces of information I was putting this together was uh, ring announcer Brian. Um, I asked a couple of questions on Twitter, and he was great and responded in pretty much five minutes every time. Uh, with all the information I needed, so um, certainly thanks to him for that. Um, specifically with this being our first sort of podcast, like I said, we're just trying to figure out how to do this. We're not used to talking like we normally do. We had to do a little bit of research. We had to write things down. We're going to try and figure out all the technology later. Um, many podcasts um, i got to thank that I listened to. Probably too many to name, um, but like I said, we only started this five days ago. We had no idea what we were doing. I put out a plea on Twitter, and uh, yeah, people who I've known for a very short time and people I have no idea who they even were at that time tagged other people. And, and we've had so many offers of help. Um, and I have been sending little messages out. Hey, how do you do this? How do you get Audacity up? Uh, what should I look at? Hey, look at this YouTube video. So thank you to all those people who've uh, got us started. And um, yeah, this one's not going to be very professional. We just wanted to get it out. It just happened that Nova Pro happened. That's going to be one of our events that we want to talk about probably on a monthly basis. 
And hopefully by the time we do our next one, we'll be a little more professional. We'll have the microphone working properly, but we just wanted to get the content out on this first one. Um, certainly email us with any suggestions that you have or contact us on Twitter. And once again, at Twitter at MGB Wrestling Pod, or you can email us at uh, MGB Wrestling Pod at gmail.com. And um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I've been Graham Bagshaw. And I'm Mason Bagshaw. And he forgot to put it on the stop so we can pause it. So we've got our first little technical issue straight away. All right, goodbye, everyone.